Wow. Incredible. Shamina Singh and Sir Elton John there. Give it up for them one more time, please. Please. So much to take from that. Um, you know, first of all, put your arms around people. Feel the love. I think that's so important. And hope is the greatest fuel for us as the human race. Where would, be, where would we be without hope? You know, I think it's so amazing. And, and also uh, what was said there about some of the blockers to progress and that stigma and not allowing people to be who they are, who they really are. So before we can really progress, I think one of the messages I take, you know, with all the science, all the teamwork, every, all the knowledge that we have, first and foremost, we've got to allow ourselves and the people around them to be who they really are and to be their best selves. So uh, thank you, that was wonderful. Really great to hear from Sir Elton John. Now, um, we're gonna move on to our next panel. The chairs have been swiftly set and um, you can't have a global conference on inclusion without discussing what's happening to the physical space around us. And to lead our discussion on the cutting edge of climate change is Nigel Toppin, a UN climate change high level uh, champion. So can you, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Nigel Toppin. Thank, thank you, Aid, for that introduction. And we're, we're really going to try and live up to the need to deliver some messages of hope, um, which, is, which is the fuel for, for driving change and inclusive growth. Um, yeah, morning, everyone. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. The, the, um, I think it's raining. It's, it's, it's raining inside. <laughs> yeah. it's, raining. it's a blessing. <laughs> it's raining. Can't um, see anybody. The, the, you know, I'm, I'm struck that the. Um, the importance of hope in, in challenging times. You know, the, the famous American author F. Scott Fitzgerald once said that the, the, the test of a first-rate mind is the ability to hold two opposing truths um, in your mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. And we know that there is, a, there, there is a grim truth in the world in the state of the climate crisis and the state of geopolitics, but there is also a very positive truth, the truth of hope, that there are um, amazing leaders from all geographies and all sectors um, doing things, um, innovating, collaborating, um, and it's focusing on those which can give us cause for hope. So I'm really looking forward to exploring those, um, those stories of practical collaborative change, driving inclusive growth uh, uh, that we can all learn from. So we're gonna, we're gonna, um, we've got a, an amazing audience. We have a, a former president of Columbia, indigenous peoples leader, a, a director of the, the, the loan program in, in the States, and a, and a philanthropic leader, um, even, even Duke Hinder Ibrahim Jigashar and, um, and Rohini Narakini and Nilekani. Um, but let me, start, let me start with you, um, Ivan. Um, you did a, uh, you've done a lot of work on tackling the issue of deforestation. Um, so tell us a little bit about the uh, sort of flavor of the work that you've done, and in particular, how you've made sure that's an inclusive process that's not just driven top down. Well, thank you so much, Nigel. It's a great honor for me to be in this amazing panel with people that I admire and, and respect a lot. And let me begin by saying something. The world talks a lot about carbon neutrality, but we need to talk more about nature positive solutions. And, um, and the reason why this is so important is because n without nature positive solutions, we're not going to accomplish the NDCs. And uh, if it were a country, <coughs> deforestation and negative use of land will be the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases globally. And when we think about uh, the places of the world that are in danger, you have the Amazon basin, you have the Congo basin, you have some of the most important uh, basins in Southeast Asia and many other places. But just think of the Amazon. The Amazon every year basically captures 10% of all the world greenhouse gases emissions. But we have lost in the last four decades the size of France and Germany together due to deforestation. And if the trend that we have of deforestation continues, in less than a decade, the Amazon is no longer going to be a contention wall, but it will become a net emitter. And we have to act now. 
So how do we act? And that takes me to three criteria: Market-driven nature-based solutions. And you need to combine carrot and stick. So you need to tackle the environmental crimes. In most of the Amazonic countries, the environmental crimes don't have imprisonment sentence. So you need to say, we're going to be tough with those crimes. But you have to provide good incentives for those market-driven nature solutions. And those are connected with aggregated value chains. Simple. You need to guarantee that products like Camu Camu, Acai, Copo Azul, Sacha Inchi from the Amazon have access to, to world markets because they are sustainable, they are scalable, and they provide a, a way of living with communities. So that's a solution that is needed. In the other hand, you need to use technology to tackle the main causes of deforestation. Illegal mining, illegal cattle, illegal wood, and illegal crops. And just on illegal mining, technology can help us identify where are those gigantic yellow machines located and tell that to the whole world so everybody is exposed how those machines got there and use technology also to make those machines unoperable. And another solution that is very important, build natural conservation contracts with indigenous and local communities. Because we have to understand that we can do everything right in terms of carbon neutrality in the Western Hemisphere, but if we don't get the Amazon right, we won't meet the, the, the indicators that are uh, our approach to 2030 and 2050. So I'll finish by saying that from our perspective, the concrete solutions start with one simple one. How do you expand your protected areas? And people tend to say, OK, 30 by 30, fine. But you know what? We were able to pass in Colombia from 13% protected areas to more than 30% in 2022. So we can do 20 before 30, 30 before 30. And that's a major achievement that most developing countries and the whole world needs to achieve. And second, create the market conditions so that biodiversity credits and nature credits can become a source of income for countries, communities, and indigenous groups. Those are specific elements that I will, that I will present. Thank you. I mean, those extensions of protected areas are really impressive. And your last point reminds me of a, a convers an event I was at last year um, looking at how do we roll out um, market solutions in, in Africa. And, and, a, and a community organizer stood up and said, what you need to remember right now is that there's a man in the forest with an axe trying to decide how to put money on the, put food on the table for the family. So if we don't change the incentives, the axe wins, right? So a great, great example. Thank you, Ethan. Um, and I might come back to you later to talk a bit more about the importance of markets. Um, let, let me turn now to Rohini and, and, and the, the, the role of philanthropy. Um, uh, you know, we have a, a complete mix here of different sectors. And Rohini, you've been a, a huge advocate. I know you're also an author and, and a publisher. We may come back to talk more about education. But tell us a little bit about some of the examples of how philanthropy can play a catalytic role in driving inclusive growth. Yeah, no, I think philanthropy is very critical right now as risk capital and to help especially social entrepreneurs to innovate so that then the markets and the state can pick up and scale once those opportunities because social entrepreneurs are very, very close to people and communities at the first mile where the problems are. And so um, I think philanthropy really needs to step up. Today, globally, only about 2% of all philanthropy goes into climate and the environment. And I agree that we need to really step up looking at biodiversity and conservation, um, along with thinking of other things uh, for mitigation. Um, so I think the risk capital, the ability to, be a to have patient capital, just the ability to allow people to experiment over time. And then I think it plays a very critical role right now. In uh, my philanthropy in India, Climate and environment is my largest portfolio. And we have wonderful civil society organizations doing everything from great new data and research gathering to actually working with tribal and forest communities to ensure that they get their rights. So there's a whole spectrum there. And um, right now, we have started something called the India Climate Collaborative to help drive, along with the government in many cases, the agenda to move forward on our NDCs, um, to open up new opportunities for our energy transition, and uh, also to work with our communities. Because in India, 
as, as climate risks begin to show, and we all know they're already here, it's going to be our poor and vulnerable communities that are going to get hit the most. So one of the things, um, an organization I support, and I'll stop here because there are too many examples, is called SEEDS. And what they do is they've helped communities. They've looked at the 150 most vulnerable climate spots in India, and they work with communities there to say, what is your loss potential? If something happens, what do you stand to lose? And they get that attested in advance so that when, if, God forbid, an uh, event happens, the government can respond in the right way to address the loss that those communities are going to incur. So there's a lot of such innovation happening in India, which uh, uh, we hope can be shared everywhere, and philanthropy must support it. I think there's too much wealth hanging around in the world, all dressed up with nowhere to go. It should come <laughs> out. <laughs> and and Rohini, um, you, you, you've, I know we have very little time, but you've just touched on the, the fact that some of the work is back with communities and technology, and some yes. of the work is communities engaging with government. So yes. it seems to me that nearly everywhere that we're um, innovating, there's an element of collaboration that, 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 that we can't, if we don't bring communities with us. And I want to turn to Jigga Shah now, as the director of the, 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 the loan program office in the Department of Energy in the States, now overseeing one of the most ambitious um, uh, allocations of capital to, cl to climate solutions in the world. Um, so, Jigga, tell us a little bit about some of the cutting edge solutions that you're applying in this, and in particular, how you're working with communities on the way. Yeah, no, thanks for including me here. I, look, I think that energy is, has been the key to human flourishing for a very long time, right? So I think this is uh, something that we, frankly, measure around the world, right? Access to electricity, access to energy, um, and, and people find energy, right? Whether it's uh, their own human energy or whether it's diesel power or whether it's whatever it is that they need to do, wood, et cetera. And so I think part of what we're trying to figure out how to do is to democratize that, um, that innovation scale, right? I mean, the Department of Energy has long been the best uh, organization in the world at innovation and research, right, with the 14 national labs, and, et cetera. But what you find is, is that you know, raw capitalism ends up only supporting companies that have already dominated in the energy space, right? Because they have a balance sheet, they have the ability to borrow money to do the next thing. And so our loan office has been essential to innovators and entrepreneurs to be able to you know, get across that valley of death. We build the bridge to bankability. And so when you think about what we've accomplished in the past, where we did all the you know, largest solar and wind projects in the United States, we provided essential debt capital. Today, those have crossed the bridge to bankability. Now you see um, many countries around the world deploying those technologies using more traditional commercial finance. That wouldn't have occurred had it not been for our intervention earlier. I think today, what we're finding is, is that what America is quite good at, and many entrepreneurs, frankly, around the world are quite good at, as small as beautiful as opposed to bigger is better. And so we have transformed what we're doing at the Loan Programs Office to be able to fund you know, thousands of $10,000 deployments instead of one large billion dollar project, right? And so that was this Project Hestia deal that we were doing where 25% of all those deployments are in Puerto Rico. They're creating microgrids for every single home and so that they're far more resilient. And you know, the average income that is, um, that is deploying these things are now at or below the average income of Puerto Rico, right? So, um, so it's actually a, quite of an, an inclusive movement that's occurring. We separately did a microgrid at uh, a tribal nation in California. Um, and you know, what they were looking for was that resiliency uh, that they needed so that they weren't shut off from power during a wildfire event or, or something else, right? And you know, I think one of the challenges that we have today internationally is that there continues to be this feeling amongst many of the development banks that it's, it's not worth helping people unless we can build them a modern grid powered by nuclear power like connected throughout the entire sort of part of, you know, Western Africa or Eastern Africa or whatever it is, right? And I mean, I think that, I think it's just a travesty that we think that way, right? When you think about all of the uh, devices that we have innovated around where we can give people access to modern energy for $12, right? We can give people access to modern energy 
for you know ten thousand dollars at a birthing clinic where you know right now they're giving you know like birth to cell phone light right like these things are things that we can just solve next week it's not a lot of money they have it all in their bezos earth fund that they've committed to usaid or to this or that but i feel like we have this desire to do this thing that'll take 30 years that's fairly impossible to do given local conditions. When we have technologies today that we've invented over the last 10 years, they're ready to deploy at scale now, right? So for us as the government and the loan program, you know, we're responsive to what innovators and philanthropies and others want to do. You don't want us telling everybody, you know, this is how you shall do it. You really need that entrepreneurial energy and those ideas coming from the marketplace and then for us to be backing them. And it, it's really interesting. It seems to me that, um, you know, there's a sort of truism that what gets measured gets managed. And then often, that, and, and that I think that often leads to what's easy to measure gets managed. Okay. And that's not necessarily what we want. So in, in, um, that, for example, can often mean that we measure deployment of capital rather than uh, numbers of human lives made resilient. And that's a very active conversation here in DC right yeah. now. Is I think the, the multilateral banks have tended to obsess with deployment at the expense of um, of impact, which is harder, right? Because you have to break things up and be more, more nuanced. So really interesting to hear that you've, you know, you don't have just one overarching program. You've got these, obviously, these broken down so that you're ad addressing the different needs of different, um, di different sectors of community, not, not just the, the big 30-year nuclear um, mega projects. Thank you. Let, and that's a, that's a really good link, link to, to Hindu. Um, uh, Hindu, first of all, congratulations. I know you've just been elected as the chair of the, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous um, People's Issues. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and I know you're still an ambassador for the UN Climate Champions, which we, we did a lot of work together, so, so that's great. Um, uh, you know, the call for genuine involvement and inclusion in decision-making programs of, 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 of communities and particularly indigenous peoples is, has been around for a long time. Tell us a little bit about where you see progress being made, where indigenous peoples are being involved in decision-making progress and how that's improving the quality of the solutions as well as the quality of lives. Thank you, Nigel. Good morning. It's really a great pleasure to be with all of you here. So, you know, indigenous peoples are already leading by example. We do not wait for anyone. We're already protecting 80% of the world's biodiversity. And we do that just as duty. We are not doing that as job or as someone asking us, because we know the importance of nature, the interconnectivity between all the ecosystems. And that's where we need the collaboration, where we need to sit all together. So where I'm seeing that, having this panel is already like a good example. But are we implementing what are we are saying? So this is where we are missing. So we need to rebuild this trust. The community like mine, when we talk at the COP28, we have to go away from the fossil fuel, we have to invest on nature, we have to protect nature. And when I go back home, we experiencing more than 132 Fahrenheit. So it's like unbelievable how you can live on that. And it's not because we are nomadic, we cannot uh, uh, get access to the AC to live. Because it is about our life. It is about our food, our access to the water. It is about the survival of all the peoples. So we need to rebuild the trust. What we are saying have to respect what we are doing on the ground. And now we are talking about the just transitions. I really love what you all said here. But just transitions, that's the way that is going. We need a critical minerals to pass from one side to another one. All the critical minerals are in the high spot biodiversity, who are the home of indigenous peoples. Do we have a measure how much we have to extract again for our electric vehicle? Of course. But how about the people who do not have water to drink? Are we thinking about sharing that back? So that's where indigenous peoples wanted to be in the tables, to say, listen, you want to have a just transition? We are there to guide you. We cannot continuously doing what's happened in the past. When we discover oil, we say we have the right solutions, and then we have to go far from the call. And at the end of the day, climate change, biodiversity loss, and everything. So now, if we want to have a just transition, it has to be just equitable, sharing with all the countries. Developing nations, Latin America, Africa, Asia, 
have all this mineral. Developed nations wanted to have this mineral. Okay, let's sit down together. Let's discuss together. And indigenous peoples must be in the tables because it is our home. We are talking about our mineral. We are talking about our biodiversity. <coughs> so we need to set this discussion, either we like it or not, but in which condition and how are we going to do that? So indigenous peoples have this solution for you. You come sit with us and we can tell you. <laughs> so we've, got, we've only got about five minutes left. Let's have a quick, a, a quick whiz round, just a quick follow-up question for, for each of you and just a sort of one minute answer. Um, Ivan, we, um, you talked about the importance of markets. I know you're um, on the board of the, uh, ACME, the African Carbon Markets Initiative. Say a little bit about the importance for communities and countries, that in, in, in emerging communities and countries, of those voluntary carbon markets and the role of ACME in So, so like I, I'm going to connect the dots of many things that have been said here that are very interesting. The fact is that the world is highly indebted. So when you look at debt to GDP ratios on average in the world, they're above 90%, which means that there's very limited fiscal space for countries to finance all the climate action. And then you ask how much is needed for regions to achieve what they want to achieve. Just Africa needs to invest almost $2.8 trillion in the next seven years just to achieve the NDCs. So is that money going to come from, from donors, bilaterals? I don't think so. Is that money going to come from government budgets? I don't think so. So where's that money going to come from? And that's the role that the market plays because you do have people that are saying, I, we want companies and even countries saying we want to buy the credits. So you need to have the projects that allow through credits to massively mobilize capital and accelerate energy transition, clean cooking, protection of ecosystems, recovery, and so on. And we have taken lessons. So we have to improve integrity, we have to include good accounting, but we also need to ensure that communities are empowered to achieve what they want to achieve. And I think that's what the Africa Carbon Markets Initiative inst intends to do. Take the lessons, improve the standards, improve the integrity, improve the accounting, but make possible a massive mobilization of ESG investment that can help the countries achieve their NDCs. So that's why I support the initiative. I've been participating with our own lessons, and uh, as I have said it, and I know it can be controversial, I said, if voluntary carbon markets did not exist, we will have to invent it. Because it has, it has been an effective mechanism to mobilize capital, while in many other conversations there are a lot of pledges, but not few disbursements. Yeah. And I think this is a good example, a sort of macro example of Hindu, what you talked about in terms of having the right voices around the table. If all of the standards and conversations are only um, done in the, in, in, the, in the sort of elite halls in London and and Washington DC and not involving and including the genuine voices of those communities who stand for benefit, then, then they'll be skewed in a particular way. Thank you. Um, Rohini, uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier, you're, you're, uh, as well as all your philanthropy, you're an author and a publisher. Um, the, 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 you know, we know that there's a whole generation that is growing up increasingly well-educated in the, the, the very worry, and very troubling, frightening science of climate change. Say, say a little bit about the importance of education in terms of giving more agency to young people of the, all the different ways that they can be involved in forging the positive solutions. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's both an aging world and a very young world. Um, India is a very young country and our young people have to carry the hope because without hope you cannot act. So I think, allow, I think one of the things education has to do is to reduce the nature deficit that especially urban children have because when you're connected with nature, you begin to get back from nature the hope you need to act. So throughout our education work, of course, we do uh, try to ensure this interdisciplinary approach. But I think you're right that young people need to find hope and uh, hope in order to act, not hope as idle sort of optimism, but hope so that hope is the new religion, you know. And that's a religion that doesn't divide. <laughs> it unites us all. But think, because think, today there are, there are 8 billion people, all of whom have realized that we are in this together, and we're in it, we float together or we sink together. And imagine when 8 billion people have a common project, 
what would humanity do? And I want us to remember that and not that doomsday is around the corner because human beings always innovate. Thank yeah. you. And it, it does seem to me that, that absolutely we, that sometimes we don't seem to have much faith in ourselves yes. or self-confidence. So you know, and, and just, just briefly. But also in our empathy and in our ability to turn empathy to compassion. I'm all for markets, all for the state, all for everything, but we are all human beings first. And if we can activate our empathy, just like Sir Elton John said, I think miracles can happen. So we need empathy and engineering. Empathy yeah. and technology. I'm yeah. all for technology. Um, just, just very briefly, because I know, I know um, Rahim's got uh, um, very keen on some exponential initiatives. Yes. One, one of the things, just say a little bit about how the, the IRA and the work you're doing is not just deploying technology in the States, but driving costs down, which will then be, uh, make technology more available all over the world. Well, if you don't mind, maybe I'll answer a slightly different question that Henry brought up. I think, you know, the, when the president passed the IRA and the bipartisan infrastructure law, one of the things that we were mandated to do were these community benefits plans, right? And so one of the loans, we've done about $20 billion of loans in critical minerals and batteries. And one of the uh, loans we did was with Cyber Resources, who, which get graphite from Mozambique into Louisiana for final processing. I think when you look at the level of engagement that we did with indigenous peoples there, made sure that folks who live in Mozambique are the ones getting the jobs there, making sure they're being paid a fair wage, making sure that women have the right to work there as well. We're all under a nonprofit that you know is continuously improving the process out of London. I don't think this is perfect, but I do think that ensuring that that hard work is being done has also allowed the US to compete favorably against any of the other countries around the world who want those critical minerals because I think countries see that we're doing things in a far more serious way than many other countries are doing. Really interesting that I think um, that, that, that higher standards in terms of environmental and social integrity and indigenous people's engagement could actually end up being a market advantage. Hindu, I know, I know we're at time, but just a final thought from you on how to build and maintain trust between, uh, you know, I remember um, in, in, uh, in Dubai, for me, one of the highlights was the um, the call to action on food, which had leaders of indigenous peoples, smallholder farmers groups, and major food companies all supporting one, one call to action. It felt like there was a really palpable shift in trust there. How do we build that and maintain it, just we briefly? Can, we can build this trust in both sides. We trusted peoples, but they are not trusting us. Direct access finance, without intermediaries. All the peoples who wanted to invest on indigenous peoples, because it is an investment. When you give a direct access finance for an indigenous person, it is not only the bilateral benefit, it is everyone that benefits. So there is no way that you just, uh, we, we trust you, we protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. You should trust us to give us your billion that you have flowing up that we do not see on the ground to the communities. Then of course we can manage that. Maybe we are not a bankers who can do all the Excel that you are expecting, but we are a good peoples who can protect the nature, who know how to plant the trees, who know how to harvest, who know how to protect you. So we trust you, you trust us. Give us the direct access finance and we can do the job. Great. So thank you all for lots of wonderful examples of the, the, if you like, the, I, I think the, the sort of alchemy of combining technical expertise yeah. of all various sorts and human empathy to come together um, to drive inclusive innovation, to drive inclusive growth. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank the whole panel. Thank you.